it's we're proud of what, what we've done and what we do. Metallica are the biggest heavy metal band in the world. Over the course of their 25 year career, they sold over 90 million albums, won Grammy Awards, and toured the world dozens of times. They've survived death, alcohol addiction, on stage accidents, lineup changes, and endless accusations of selling out to become a genuine musical phenomenon. They took something that's like an um, extreme rock music and put it right to the mainstream. They're up there with the Giants, Maiden, Priest, Sabbath, Motorhead. Uh, in fact, in terms of American metal, they may be number one. Metallica's great strength is their live show. They are and they've always been one of the finest live bands you've ever seen. We write for ourselves. Do you think that deep within the nucleus of what we do, it's not really that different than it used to be. Metallica, you know, we retain like the metal part of it always. It always is heavy. It's about anything you really want to explain. Metallica of today is a far different beast than the one which first stepped on stage in Los Angeles back in March 1982. They took a bunch of different bands and like basically threw them in a blender and sped it up. So for me, it was like a lot of stuff they did was almost familiar. Just the over the top craziness. I mean, they were playing the kind of music nobody really had done too much before. I mean, there was Motorhead and, you know, Venom and stuff like that. But it was sped up with, you know, attitude and everything else with it. You know, no one else was doing that at the time. Teenage bands started out by playing covers of British bands such as Diamond Head, Sweet Savage, Venom, and Blitzkrieg, who were making waves at the time as part of a new movement in music called the New Wave of British Heavy Metal. You wouldn't have thought that these bands from Newcastle and these working men's clubs in the north of England would have had a profound impact on these American bands, but they really did. Um, uh, Lars Ulrich uh, got, somehow managed to get himself onto a metal compilation album, even though he couldn't play drums and didn't even have a band. So he advertised to get a band together, and they kind of, they had, of course, they had to go answer and put the band together, and that's how they basically formed the band. The first track that got noticed by people hit the lights, which appeared on the very first Metal Massacre compilation album put out by Metal Blade. At the time when that happened, there wasn't really a Metallica lineup, but Lars had got to know the guy who ran Metal Blade, Brian Slagle, and he just said, Look, if you can get a lineup together and go in the studio and do a song, I'll put it on this record which represented what was going on in the, the Bay Area and in America particularly on the underground metal scene at the time. So that was really the birth of Metallica. I think they, they put an ad out that they were looking for a guitar player and I think Dave responded to the ad. And uh, you know, and Dave saw that they were influenced by New Wave of British Heavy Metal, so I, I believe that's how they got together. Metallica only showed real promise 
after they were joined by two talented musicians, guitarist Dave Mustaine and bassist Cliff Burton. Mustaine was crucial to the history of Metallica because he was he had this fiery attitude, very much like the attitude of the hardcore punks in Los Angeles at the time. And also he was an incredible musician. Um, some of the musicians in Slayer, I was talking to them the other day and they told me that they used to go to these early Metallica shows to watch Dave Mustaine play his lead guitar. He used to be able to, to play these solos without actually looking at the instrument, which really impressed them. They were really drunk, you know, doing those shows that uh, uh, you could hear the improvement when Cliff had joined, just with the, uh, the amazing uh, technique he had on the bass. You know, they just only played a couple of gigs together with Cliff and Dave in the band at the same time. It was pretty much off the hook. It was. I remember watching this band, and it was like, it, it was uh, pretty amazing, actually. It was pretty raw, um, but it was a trip because you had Dave Mustaine and James, and like they both kind of like were front men, like one, you know, like for one song, James would announce that song or whatever, and then for another song, you know, Dave would, you know, talk. I'm sure you've all heard. And, uh, and you kind of saw that kind of separation there, you know, but it kind of worked. And uh, James was like off the hook. He reminded me of like Reagan from the, from the Exorcist. He was just like, wow, you know, just real crazy. Um, but it was something really cool, you know, and I knew they were, they were going to do something from that first show. They, they'd seen Cliff play in a band called Trauma who were based here in the Bay Area. Cliff. Cliff was a very nice guy. I had met him when he was in, uh, in a band called Trauma before that and I knew somebody, a friend of mine knew the guitar player from Trauma so we would go see them and stuff and uh, Cliff was amazing. He's just, you, you looked at him like everybody else in the band, I mean they were good at what they did I guess but they weren't, you know, moving like he did and it's just, he was the focal point of that whole band. Everybody just said, this band is pretty good, but you gotta see this bass player. And, you know, everybody's just talking about this bass player. It's just uh, unbelievable. So, uh, naturally, you know, it was a must to see. All of a sudden, he was in Metallica. Trauma, Trauma came and played a show down in LA where the, the guys in Metallica were based at the time. And uh, they were really blown away by how great Cliff was and they got a hold of Cliff and like, dude, we, we want you to join our band because they weren't happy with Ron. Uh, and uh, and Cl Cliff said, well, I'd be in to join you guys, but I ain't gonna move to LA. So you're gonna have to come up here if, if, if you want me to join your band. Los Angeles at the time was preoccupied with what we'd now call hair metal, with Motley Crue and Rat and Warrant. <laughs> Los Angeles is the city you think of when you think of heavy metal. This very sort of soft, plasticky, sing-along kind of rubbish. All this poser hairspray bands, they hated them. It's like, what is this? And then in San Francisco, you had all these thrash metal nutters who um, had developed a taste for much more aggressive music that was much faster, much heavier than anything you'd get in Los Angeles. So they uh, kicked Ron out of the band and, and, and moved up here to San Francisco where they'd, they'd already gigged a few times and were very successful and really built a following up here and they loved it here anyway. So it was just a natural for them to move here and that's how they got together with Cliff. <laughs>
San Francisco shows were just off the hook. Crazy drunken bashes. <laughs> Well, it's kind of funny, the first time I took pictures of them, uh, there was no camera policy, and um, I ended up getting my film taken away by the security. They tried to expose the film, and um, I ended up getting it back. Luckily, I, re I rewound it back into the camera, and uh, that ended up being the shot that Cliff used on the album, which is ironic, so it almost didn't exist. Back then, you were allowed to take pictures of all the, the concerts. You didn't have to have a photo pass, you know? It wasn't big business like it is now, you know? First three songs and all that baloney. So uh, I just thought it was really cool to document, you know, the shows. And it was really neat to get some really cool concert shots in there. They gained popularity pretty fast. You know, I'd say within, within a year's time, a lot of people knew about them that never knew about them before, and their popularity got bigger and bigger after that. Cliff, um, he would like headbang, and the uh, uh, rest of the band would be going like, like this fast. He would be going like half speed, and I could just get some incredible shots of him with his hair sticking straight up in the air. Yeah, you couldn't get a bad photo of him. He was just an incredible bass player all the way around. But uh, yeah, I think Cliff, he, he was just, I don't know, I've never seen anybody like him to this day. I mean, he used all the crazy wah-wah pedals, the effects and stuff. It was just incredible. Just the conviction they had on stage. Uh, James, um, at first he wasn't that much of a front man. He wasn't very sure of himself. But uh, through the years, he's really gotten really good at that. Um, now it's like he's a natural up there. So what do you think is important for an album to come out and become a classic? Wow, uh, we're still working on that, you know? You always, it's never the best, never. You can always do it better and you're never satisfied, mm -hmm. which is not a bad thing. You know, you always, you always want to find that perfect thing, you know? And uh, that's what kind of drives you. Uh, I think the drive and the, the will to try new things, mm -hmm. to experiment and to push each other. In early 1983, Metallica were invited to New York by store owner John Zazula, who funded the recording of their debut album and released it on his own Megaforce label after failing to interest any record labels in the band. But before this happened, Dave Mustaine was fired. Yeah, well, Dave, Dave had been, been, been a problem for a long time with, it, with, with his alcoholism and, and, and such. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, basically, when, when they were uh, they had basically decided they wanted to get rid of him when they were traveling to New York to uh, uh, get ready to, re to record the album. You know, and and uh, uh, they, they, they were like, uh, I, I think, listening to tapes on the way down there while Dave was sleeping in the, in the, in the, in the back. And uh, they, they, were, they were very interested in uh, Kirk Hammett, who played with a band called Exodus, who Metallica had played with a few times. So when they got there, it was like, you know, Johnny Z's like, hey, you know, Great, let's sign a record contract. And they're like, <laughs> you know, we got a problem. So, you know, they called Kirk, and he was the only guy they called. And uh, I remember, I remember when he got that call. Um, he was like, you know, Exodus was doing really well, and he was like, and he was asking, you know, he asked me, he asked you know his friends and stuff, you know, what do you think I should do? And I said, well, man, they're they're signing a record deal, dude, and they're really good. So, you know. You might want to think about doing that. So, so it was like when they first got there to to to, to New York, uh, is is like they made the phone call to Kirk and they wanted to, Kirk to fly out there, and then they they had to tell Dave, hey dude, you're out of the band. Like they did like I think like the day after the first day they were there, they all get around Dave and wake him up and tell him he's he's out of the band, and uh, you know you know you know which, which which was of course very upsetting to Dave. They put him on a gr a Greyhound bus all the way back to L. A. From New York to LA, so he had a couple of days on the road to th think about it, and you know they had to get him out of there. Kirk, Kirk was flying in, and if Kirk got in there, uh, it would have been a big fight. <laughs> so they had to get Dave out of there as soon as they could. Musically, it was really a nice fit, but I think um, uh, personality-wise, something had to give. But they, but what they brought to the table together for Metallica was really unique because there's a lot of riffs that that Dave had brought to Metallica that they used even later on after he left. Dave 
did everything 110. He was on 10 all the time, you know. Whatever Dave wanted, Dave got, basically, you know. So when he left the band, they lost a little something, but they gained stability as far as I'm concerned. You know, uh, Kirk's a good guitar player too, you know. Uh, so I think that's what they needed, you know. Dave running that show would have probably ended up dragging them straight down the toilet. Dave, Dave was a very, Dave was difficult. He was enough to deal with when he was sober. When that guy got drunk, forget about it. Mustaine went on through Megadeth to develop and forge his own path, come up with some great material and some great ideas in his own right, but they're very much Mustaine driving his own furrow. With other people involved, but it is still very much Mustaine's vision, Metallica became the vision of all of them. So the importance of where Metallica went is the fact that they never tried to replace what Mustaine was. They took on their own role. On Kill Em All, I think you can hear with Four Horsemen, which is also known as Mechanics, and done by Megadeth in their first album, Killing Is My Business Biz and Business Is Good, Mustaine's influence, the way that songs were structured. that a lot of Mustaine's vocal phrasing Hetfield took on when he became the lead singer in the band. And Mustaine has always been very vocal about the fact that Hetfield was influenced heavily by what he did. Megadeth and Metallica would have a tempestuous relationship for the next two decades. But in 1983, Metallica had more important things on their minds. After recruiting Exodus guitarist Kirk Hammett to replace Dave Mustaine, they recorded a blistering debut album, Kill Em All, so named in response to the record company executives who had failed to show any interest. The album Kill Em All with Kirk's guitar playing sounds so much better than the demos in my opinion. I mean, when I, when I listen to the demos, I mean, I don't even know how they got signed because they just sound so awful compared uh, to, to what, was, what was on the album which was very polished and had all, had all this speed and aggressiveness. I mean, my first turn onto them was when I heard Kill Em All. That album changed my life. I mean, I used to think heavy, I used to think the heaviest thing in metal was like Iron Maiden pre-Sabbath. And when I heard Kill Em All, everything that I thought was heavy was considered obsolete. I mean, this made you know, Iron Maiden sound like the Bee Gees. They hooked up with Johnny Z, you know, with Megaforce Records. And he was probably one of the strongest of the independents at the time. And he pushed them. He pushed them like, you know, crazy. And plus they just, you know, at that time it was just exploding. They got their demo out early, so a lot of people from all the underground had already heard about them. They probably put out 2,000 demos, you know, worldwide, you know, through the tape trading. It's, you know, it's a nice little network. And, and I think by doing that groundwork and then just being pushed and having the records, you know, on the, on the shelves, when they did, it just really took off. And they, you know, and then of course they got on good tours you know, early on, and they were out there. You got to get as much exposure as you can, you know. It just exploded in, in, in the underground. They toured extensively across the states, and, uh, you know, you know, and got Kill Em All was doing like 65,000 copies worldwide on a tiny little label. That was really, really good. Kill Em All is an all time great record. It's just still astonishing to this day. You can reel the songs off now, Motorbread, to Phantom Lord, to No Remorse, to Seek and Destroy, to Whiplash, to Four Horsemen, to Jump in the Fire, and they're all great numbers. And you know immediately how each one of them sounds. And the thing is, although Metallica's power and extremity now is certainly diminished because so much has changed in the last two decades, what's left are great songs, very well played, and extremely well constructed, and perform with a real sense of verve and style by the band who really felt they were on the verge of something great. Kill Em All became, as it were, an all-time great thrash album, but it was more than that. It turned metal on its head. Kill Em All was fast and raw, but Metallica, and in particular James and Cliff, were rapidly developing as songwriters, and it was clear that their music wouldn't confine itself to the thrash metal style for long. After tours with Raven and Venom, they returned to Laurel's Ulrich's home country of Denmark to record their next album, Ride the Lightning. Ride the Lightning was Metallica's second album, and I think it took everybody by surprise. Now, Kill Em All was a very good debut, very strong debut. It defined a sound, 
and started to define an era which became known as thrash. But nobody was expecting the step up Metallica took with Ride the Lightning, and they really did step up. took it to another level on this set on Ride the Lightning you know the the lyrics were a little better the you know the production was a little better the the songs were a bit more aggressive than on the first one suddenly there was an epic feel to some of the songs like Fade to Black Trapped Under Ice suddenly you had a sense of confidence on, on tracks like Call of Cthulhu and Fight Fire with Fire and for whom the bell tolls that you hadn't really heard before. And the thing about Ride the Lightning is that it's a consistent album from beginning to end. There are moments in Kinnamore that slightly dip. There is nothing on Ride the Lightning that dips. Everything is at such a high standard. To a large extent, I feel it's because the lineup that they had at the time, which many would regard rightly as the classic lineup Kirk Hammett guitar, James Hepford guitar vocals, Lars Ulrich drums, Cliff Burton bass, plus Fleming Rasmussen as producer engineer gave them a sensibility and a belonging and a focus. And I think it's really true to this day that Metallica diehards argue incessantly, Ride the Lightning or Master of Puppets, which was the greatest Metallica album, but it is one of those two. And I think it, Ride the Lightning belongs up there. And to me, I'd actually put it as the finest because it was the moment Metallica became great. I just think from beginning to end, it's a great record. That's a fucking new day. While Ride the Lightning was a masterpiece, some fans were concerned by the direction Metallica took with the acoustic ballad Fade to Black. For the first time, the band were faced with accusations of selling out to a more commercial direction. By the time Ride the Lightning came out, you had a lot of thrash metal bands. The term had been coined. You had something called the Big Four of Thrash, which was Metallica, Slayer, Anthrax, and Megadeth. Um, now, with Ride the Lightning, Metallica made it very clear that they weren't about to be confined to a genre label like thrash metal, um, which was one of the reasons they felt able to expand into ballad territory with Fate to Black. I think Fate, Fate to Black shows where, where Metallica are going. Where, at the time, it shows where they could go. You know, it shows that there's a different kind of direction that they could do. If, even though it kind of scapulates all that they're very, very good at, that because the melodic touch, it shows that there is a they can speak to a lot more people than, than, than would be. They're not going to be trapped in a scene. This, this thing could go very, very mainstream seemed to be just a, a little bit more it wasn't the full brutal thrash of kill em all it, 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 it was a little it was a little a little more progressive and not all out thrash all the way through a million miles an hour but the way kill em all mostly was you know you know but i love the album I, I mean i got addicted to the album i mean i mean it took two listens for me to get hooked to ride the lightning but then, but then that, that probably is uh, arguably my favorite metallic album i'm still undecided between that and master of puppets um, but, but, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now, if I can ride the lightning, you know, it did so well independently that that's how they eventually went from being on Megaforce to getting picked up by Electra Records.
By 1986, Metallica were riding a wave of critical and commercial popularity. A new wave of American thrash metal bands had risen up in their wake. And I think they put you know, thrash metal on the, and Bay Area in general on the map. I mean, I mean before that, it, I mean, Bay Area was always, you know, <clears throat> before that known for like, like Grateful Dead and Aiden Ashbury, the hippies, you know. And that was like the first, you know, Metallica put it on the map as, you know, as something other than that. You know, it's like the Bay Area riffing, the Bay Area metal, to where everybody started talking about it. Every record company wanted to sign a Bay Area band. You know, they don't care what they sound like, as long as they're from Bay Area and they got the Bay Area riffing or whatever. So in a way, it's like the success always kind of kills because you top out and then it dies out, you know. Every band was signed, you know, it was like a, like a stock market crash, you know, it's where everybody got in and, and that, then you know there's nobody else left to, to you know, to do anything. And, and it got so oversaturated, boring, nothing was being new, was being created, and there was something brewing up there in Seattle, and that's, that was the new thing, you know. So, yeah, and the record companies, you know, how they switch where, where they can make a buck, so. Metallica's finest hour for many fans was Master of Puppets, their heaviest, most complex, and best produced album yet. What they've already done with the first two albums, which is pretty well put a very underground floor of music, onto the edge of the mainstream, they go right onto the mainstream this one. This is the one that turns on like masses of people into rock, onto rock music, you know. People either really love Metallica or thought they were too commercial now. They're all over mainstream media. This is, this is, this is big, just proper big records. This year, Metallica reached the top 30 with their album, Master of Puppets, and Anthrax Slayer and Megadeth each released records on a major label for the first time. We're sort of like one step, we're like furthest out in like left field pretty much from the middle of any of the sort of bigger heavy metal bands today. You know, sort of as unsafe as you can get. <laughs> and um, we get away with it. <laughs> master, 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 master. Well, even just before, uh, actually, you know, uh, it was a few months early, er, earlier, it was August of 85, actually, Metallica played A Day on the Green, where they, they, they were uh, in between, uh, they played with Rat, Y&T, The Scorpions. And Ingve Malmsteen, Rat, and Y&T, a bunch of poser bands and Metallica was second on the bill. But it was interesting because um, I, in order to get one of the photo passes that they had, um, I had to do their dishes. They actually had me do their dishes. So they had me do their dishes. I had to take out the garbage, do a couple other chores around the house. <laughs> but uh, it was a great show. Um, I got really, really drunk. And I was so excited. It was like the biggest show I'd ever, I'd never been backstage at a huge festival like that. Got some, yeah, I got some great shots on there. That's all the best outdoor ones I got. But um, yeah, that was just, that was so much fun. I mean, I can't even say, describe, and that was probably what, uh, that was 20 years ago. That, 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 was, that was Metallica's first big step, I think, into the mainstream, especially out here in America. You know, they were exposed to a total mainstream crowd. And then uh, Master of Puppets came out, and almost instantly they were put on tour with Ozzy Osbourne. And, uh, and, and that's, that, that's where things come out. Everybody was jumping on the bandwagon. Everybody was walking around wearing a Master of Puppets shirt and thinking it was their first album. <laughs> Cliff, by this point, was contributing strongly to the songwriting because he had this classical influence and because he could throw in all these amazing solo sections which he wrote. Um, and, and in fact, the album is unusual. It has these extended bass solos, which don't sound like a bass because he used all kind of effects to, to change the sound. But his influence is, is, is profound on Master of Puppets. For me, it's, it's the most creative of their attempts, um, it's 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 just awesome. There's a lot of cliff in that record, and um, and just the the textures of the rhythms. It's just it's just phenomenal. It's just a, it's just it's an awesome sounding record, and I just love the songs. There's just great songs on that record. This was the moment. In many ways, Metallica have reached their peak. They were to go on to greater heights commercially, to some extent greater heights artistically, but at no point subsequently in their history were they loved and had so much affection for as they did at this particular point, and it was never really repeated. 
After five years on the road, Metallica now seemed to be on their way to the very top. A tragedy awaited them. On September 27, 1986, the tour bus they were in crashed on a mountain road in Sweden. Bass player Cliff Burton was killed at the tender age of 24. That was, uh, that was really intense. I, you know, I was at the house that morning when, they got, when we got the call. And, um, you know, we thought it was Kirk. Because we just, you know, heard his mom. She was very upset on the phone. And, and then um, she told us it was Cliff. And, um, you know, it hit really hard. Cliff was a great guy. You know, and it, it affected a lot of people, not just the band, but I mean, you know, he had a lot of tight friends in the Bay Area, and and uh, and I think James, I think him and James were just like, were, they were like this, and he was really, you know, really affected, and it took him a long time. To this day, we don't really know why it was that this bus flipped over on its side, and it was this this unbelievable stroke of bad luck that Cliff would happen to be sleeping next to a window and be thrown out and crushed by the bus. Oh, Cliff was the great, I mean, I think if Cliff was still alive, Metallica would be different as people. He's the one that kind of, you could tell how this is, you know, the slowly the success started getting to them. And, and Cliff was the only one that would, was always kind of keep, keep keeping them grounded, you know, to where he's like, don't let it get to you. And James looked up to, to Cliff, too. So there was a little bit of a toggle going on, too, because Lars is more of a flashy kind of guy. He's like, oh, the rock star. And Cliff is more pure music, like people's kind of guy, you know? And then there's a toggle going on, you know, and James is in between. James, is, you know, could be pulled either way. Cliff played a, a guiding role in Metallica, certainly, on, on the Puppets album and before. Um, and that, when that was taken away, it was very much down to Lars and James to decide the direction of the band. And then it, it was just the Lars and James team, you know. And Lars always felt, I mean, it was uh, that Cliff was in the way. I mean, you know, I mean, I know he, he would never admit it, you know, straight out, and it would be a bad thing for him to do so. But it, it was because James really looked up to, to Cliff. Cliff was so like, uh, in, in, you know, his, he was just an individual guy, you know, it's like, it didn't matter to him, like, to where everybody was in, in the scene and they wore leather, you know, and Cliff was just by himself, and he's like, I don't care, I can listen to this kind of music, but I'm not going to dress like all of you, I just got my own. He wore bell bottoms where the peg, you know, like stretch pants were in, you know, he just wouldn't do, you know, just because something was cool, you know, he just didn't care. You know, he was, he really was into music for the pure love of playing, you know. Where Lars, for example, he was a, maybe, I mean, he loves playing, I'm not saying that, but he was in it for success and money and everything else, you know. I mean, uh, so Cliff was, yeah, I mean, it's a really a different kind of guy to where you don't meet people like that every day, you know. A mere month after Cliff's death, a new bassist was recruited, Jason Newston formerly with the B-League thrash metal band Flotsam and Jetsam, was suggested to Metallica by their old friend Brian Slagle. And after auditions of both his playing and his drinking ability, was asked to join the band. A tour of Japan followed. The Japanese tour was just bizarre because it took place literally a month after Cliff died. Um, they'd only had Jason in the band a couple of weeks and they sort of put him through this initiation procedure which was tantamount to to persecution, really. They bullied him endlessly. It was all with a laugh and a joke. That they, they used to build their drink bills to his room, for example. They used to burst into his room at the dead of night and cover him with stuff, furniture and whatever, and shaving foam and all this stuff, standard hijink stuff. But it went on so long and was so kind of concentrated that I think pretty soon after that, they, they looked back on it with a bit of regret as a, as a serious bullying period. But Jason said a bit later on that he regarded it as a test. Um, could he fill Cliff's shoes? Could he handle being in a band like Metallica? And so he stood firm, which was, which, which was great because obviously he then stayed with the band for the next 15 years. First thing we realized was that we were never ever gonna find anyone like Cliff, so it was not like we were sort of looking for a Cliff Burton a second or whatever. And we just needed, you know, a bass player that would, could, would fit in. Jason as, you know, strong individual personality and so forth. And, you know, we'll see what happens when we start writing. 
we don't write on the road so it's a little early to tell. Jason came from a band called Flotsam and Jetsam, which they 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 were a metal band. They uh they they were pretty good. I mean, some of their earlier stuff is is, is pretty cool. Um I uh, I don't know exactly why they got him. Maybe he fit in personnel wise or personality wise the best. Um I mean I I like Jason. He's a, he's a nice guy too. It was tough for Jason to come in and fill the spot, you know. Not not even comparing them as players, but it's just even a personality. I think that was more than anything, you know, cuz cuz their styles are different. And, you know, and Jason does his thing, Cliff w was great in his own way, but the personality, you just couldn't you know, you couldn't match that. If you want to make comparisons between him and Cliff, he's more of like a picking bassist and stuff like that, which is fine, I guess. But if you had come from someone like Cliff, who is like all fingers and just everywhere, I would think you'd want to carry that on. Despite the constant bullying Jason received in his early months in Metallica, the new lineup gelled and their first music together appeared in the summer of 1987 on the Garage Days Revisited EP, recorded in Lars's garage in San Francisco. Now you can't remember where they were at this time. Cliff Burton had just died. And to a large proportion of Metallica fans, the band were dead as well. They didn't know how Metallica were going to carry on, if they could carry on. They found Jason Houston, who'd been formerly in Flotsam and Jetsam, got him in the band, and then faced the problem. How do you get this guy accepted by the fans? The answer is you don't try and get him accepted. He will be or he won't be. But they felt to go straight in and make an album with new material would have been asking for trouble. They wanted a buffer, and what better buffer than do a record, do a record with Jason, but to do a record of known songs, but aren't their own. So they don't immediately get criticized for the style and quality of the new material. This is almost like they're exposing their roots. So you've got Budgie, Diamond Head, Killing Joke, The Misfits, and a Scottish band from the new wave of British heavy metal called Holocaust. And they came out with it, this EP and said, this is Jason Newstead, please welcome him to the fold, but these aren't our own songs. This is a covers album. Of course, in this day and age, everybody does covers album. At the time, people were going, what? on earth this is crazy but it was a brilliant move because it allowed Jason to ease into the band without feeling the pressure of everybody saying oh the new material sucks when you compare it to Cliff's material because how could you argue with classics like Crash Course and Brain Surgery by Budgie or The Weight by Killing Joke or Helpless by Diamond Head you couldn't so it's a very shrewd move after this promising start it was a surprise that when the next full Metallica album and Justice for All appeared in 1988 it contained almost no bass. James and Lars had asked the mixers to remove it almost completely. Add to this the fact that the album was too technical in its arrangements for most fans, and it's clear that something of a crossroads was approaching for Metallica. I interviewed Jason myself a couple of years ago, and I asked him why there's no bass on Injustice for All. And although he didn't want to badmouth his former colleagues in Metallica, he explained that what had happened during the mixing process was that Lars and James had gone back and said to the mixers, take the bass down to where you can just about hear it and then take off half a dB. So basically all you can hear is a little bit of clicking of Jason's plectrum and not much else. And I asked Jason why Lars and James had felt the need to do this. I mean, he's an amazing bass player, he was a popular guy, and his, he had a long answer for me, but by and large it turned out that Lars and James were a little bit unconfident in his skills in, in the wake of Cliff. And Justice for All was, was, was a pr pretty good heavy album, you know. Some people say it was the beginning of the end. You know, but 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 uh, you know you know you know at the time I couldn't really get into Injustice for All, but now actually I, I enjoy listening to that album when I hear it now.
Jason just brought a whole different feel to the band. Um, he played with a pick instead of his fingers. Um, so some of the stuff was tighter, but uh, unfortunately you can't really hear his bass at all on Justice For All. If you look at the back cover of the album, you can see he looks kind of pissed about that. Well, that, that, that's when they were officially headlined. They did their first national headlining tour. Uh, and, 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 that, and that's basi ba ba basi basically when they really were established as probably the biggest metal band in the world. There was no, no stop stopping them. It was time for a change of direction. In 1990, Metallica had a meeting with well-known producer Bob Rock, who had worked on successful albums by Motley Crue and The Cult. Rock told Metallica that in his opinion, they had never captured on record the intensity of their live shows. After some discussion, Lars and James decided to bring him on board for the next record. It was a decision that would shape their entire career. Rod Smallwood, Iron Maiden's manager, once I think summed up very shrewdly what happens with big metal bands. Judas Priest was screaming for vengeance, Iron Maiden around the time of Peace of Mind, Pantera when they did Vulgar Display of Power, all had the capacity to step into the big league commercially by accepting what you had to do to step up, i.e. slightly smoother sound out, make slightly shorter songs with obvious melodies. None of those three either were prepared to do it or could do it, therefore they never stepped into the really big time with the big sales. Metallica did. Metallica made the step from Master and Puppets and Justice for all weather hovering around seven, eight hundred thousand sales in America to the Black Album, which goes beyond 10 million. Released in August 1991, the Black Album, as it quickly became known, was an international hit, going on to sell over 15 million copies. Its secret was its radio-friendly songs and Bob Rock's heavy, clean production. Commercial songs, because they were songs with melodies, albeit still driven by guitar. They also made a choice of working with a producer who was used to working on those sort of songs. Bob Rock, who'd worked with Aerosmith, he'd worked with Bon Jovi, he'd worked with a lot of the big commercial bands, Motley Crue. Therefore, he was a man who understood how to bring up the best in songs. That's what Metallica wanted. Metallica spent a year with Bob Rock recording the Black Album. Um, and looking back on that, you sort of understand why because it sounds so different from anything they'd done before. For starters, there was a huge bass track. He brought Jason's bass up, to the point where I think Jason was secretly quite pleased after the fiasco of the previous album. Bob Rock did a, did, did a great production job on it, and, and, and they're just some really good good songs. I mean, that was probably probably the strength. You know, people like talk about all the brutal heaviness of Kill 'Em All. What happened was Metallica got better and better in their songs. I mean, I mean, you listen to Ray the Lightning and Master Puppets; those are just really, really good songs. And the Black Album, again, really good songs. Metallica had deliberately avoided the over-complex structures of the songs on previous albums and stripped everything down to its basic components. The critics loved it, although some old-school fans mourned the lack of the speedy thrash metal elements that had made albums such as Kill 'Em All and Master of Puppets so exciting. 
a lot of people hate hate the hate the Black album, uh, and and uh, even, even though it was a, it was a very successful. I mean, even even my even myself, I actually like the Black album. Um, you, you know, you know, even though I'm, I'm I'm embarrassed to say that I'm among my comrades in the thrash metal community that that that, that I ha hang hang out with. They had just gone so mainstream. It was just ridiculous how, how mainstream they were. But, but you know what? Uh, compared to how the other day, they still had their uh, roots in metal, and it was still a heavy metal record. They always try to evolve and create something new. I mean, if you, it, just even from Kill 'Em All to Ride the Lightning, you saw the progression. Ride the Lightning to, to Master, same thing, you know, into the Black Album. And I think after the Black Album, they kind of got in, the, in that comfortable zone. As the Black Album soared up the charts in dozens of countries around the world, Metallica embarked on a huge tour that lasted three years, earning hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue and stamping their identity on the music scene forever. The band were now part of the rock establishment. The Black Album brought Metallica this whole new fan base. They had MTV exposure. Suddenly, they weren't confined to the sort of um, long-haired social misfits who had, who, had, who had snapped up Metallica's albums in the 1980s. Suddenly you had school kids into it, you had housewives into it, you had accountants into it, you had business people all listening to Metallica. Rather, and, and you, can, you can draw comparisons with Nirvana's Nevermind album, which came out within a month of the Black Album. In the summer of 1991, you had these albums which brought rock music to, to the masses. I think we made other people aware that heavier music was out there and it was actually music <laughs> and that there were people that liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever's popular doesn't mean it's good, basically. Mm -hmm. We opened the door, I think, uh, once our underground following was so huge, you know, they wanted to see, they're calling MTV, where's the Metallica video, who, you know, mm -hmm. and radio, they had to pay attention to us. Yeah. And it opened all these doors for, uh, grunge stuff, you know, it was more accepted on, you know, now on a, you can't watch TV without seeing a commercial with some, uh, you know, aggressive, aggressive music yeah, in it. That's true. I, you know, 10 years ago, I would have flipped out to hear, you know, yeah. even if it was just Aerosmith or some kind of rock Motor on the, head to, yeah, head. anything on the TV, but now it's so acceptable and that's, that's, if we've helped open the door, that's, that's fine. <laughs> By the time the Black Album came out in the early 90s, Metallica could claim to be the biggest selling metal band of all time. They could claim it because nobody had had an album as big as the Black Album in strict metal terms, and Metallica was still a strict metal band. They were the biggest metal band in the world. Were they the greatest still? Difficult to tell because by that point, Pantera had come through and almost usurped their crown as the die-hard metal kings, whereas Metallica were now the mainstream metal gods. So there was a, a difference of opinion. And a lot of Metallica fans felt while the Black Album, in its own right, was a very strong record, it signified the end of their reign as the true masters of the craft, and they'd been overtaken by the time. And we, in some ways, were in a dip, at least in terms of artistic and creative force. They were, they were the best band period uh, in, 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 their, in their glory days, e e even up to the Black Album. I I'd still 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 say still say they were they were the, 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 the one of the best bands around. In less than a decade, they had risen from the underground beginnings in the clubs of San Francisco to a position where the world lay at their feet. While the future looked rosy, the pressure of being the biggest metal band in the world was building beneath the surface. We were on the road for bordering on three years. We took a year off to clear our heads and we spent pretty much a year getting this record together. So there's there's your five years. Obviously those that time was not one of inactivity. It was one of probably the hardest work that we've ever done. After the enormous Black Album tour, I think Lars and James in particular had started to, to burn out. And after some time out, they realized that they really needed to think carefully about the future of Metallica. Could they keep on knocking out these thrash metal albums or these radio-friendly heavy metal albums? And in fact, the decision they made when they came back in 1996 with Load was to take an alternative rock direction, which horrified lots of people.
with load. You know, it was, it was it was a whole shock for the company. It was a combination of them all being short haired and GQ looking, and with with, with, with the complete change in musical direction that that, that they that they that they went into. It seems like uh, Metallica are making excuses. Hey, it's not because of our hair. It's because of our it's because of our music. I mean, I say it's a it's a big. A you know, corporate decision that that, that that they that they made. If uh, if they still wore leather jackets, bullet belts, and uh, long hair, uh, MTV wouldn't play their videos, and you know that for a fact. They they would have been looked at as some '80s thing. So they went and tried to uh, conform the, 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 their style and their look to what was accessible for today on on MTV. And I guess you know they're trying trying to appeal to to a younger audience. I think MTV has has really grabbed a generation of people, and I think if we didn't do videos, it would be something we'd be missing out on. I think videos have brought a new dimension to us that I like. The album Load sold millions, but divided the fans and critics sharply. I think it was the beginning of the end of the close relationship that Lars and James had enjoyed for at that point, 15 years, now nearly a quarter of a century since they first met. Lars took time out to become a bit of a trendy, started collecting art, enjoyed the money and fame that went with the huge success of the Black Album. James went off and I think started to self-analyze what he wanted to do. And by the time they got back together to do a record, I think there were two camps within Metallica. One was James and Jason wanting to do heavy stuff, because that's what Metallica was. The other being Lars and to a lesser extent Kirk saying, no, we should continue to explore music. Look what's been going on. Oasis have happened in England. We got Blur, you got all these great bands who are suddenly starting to come out and we want their influence to show in our music. And I think there was a confusion in the way that Metallica wanted to represent themselves, which is shown in the photos they did for promotion of Load, which had Kirk and Lars in makeup and James and Jason looking very bemused. And I think Load is a very bemused album. They kind of got too far now. It's like, they'd always be making, with Load, it's almost like an effort to make a normal rock record. You know, it's, it's, it's sounds like Southern Boogie in parts. It's, it's not right. It's a three out of five record, whereas like in the Black Album, a five out of five record. Yes, it's still, it's still big still got the sound of the band there, but they're, they're, they're kind of doing styles of music which doesn't suit them necessarily, you know. They come from a scene that, 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 that was a very underground scene, mainly mainstream, and now they're just making normal rock record music. And it's the first one where the fans start to get a bit confused and, and the fans don't like it as much. It's still a big selling record, but people are not quite so sure about it. People are scratching their heads going, hmm, not quite so sure about this, you know. It's salvation, if it does have a salvation, is that the production is very comfortable and straightforward and easy, and the songs, or more often than not, the songs are good. Do you get bothered? How do you react? How's your daily life uh, living with this? Uh, the opinions. I, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't bother me. I. We laugh a lot of the, uh, uh, at a lot of them. It's uh, pretty interesting to 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 find out what people really think. You know, For what you, they spend yeah. their time thinking about is more. You know, there's a lot of really bored people out there. Uh, I think overanalyze Metallica. <laughs> We're four guys that like to make music, you know, yeah. pretty much. And they take little things. Oh, make... they get out the big glasses and what's going on there? <laughs> Metallica didn't seem to care about their detractors' opinions. After all, they've been through it many times before. But when they released a second album of middleweight rock tunes in 1997 called Reload, even they had to take notice of the fans' opinions. Reload was mediocre at best, and many of Metallica's most loyal followers hated it. Reload is the second worst Metallica album ever. It's, now I don't know if this is true, but to me it sounds like the leftovers from Load. Stuff that they had lying around and thought, well, we think it's pretty good, we'll put it together and shove it out. Well, we wrote all these songs at one time. We wrote 30 songs, uh, and we just didn't finish them all in time for Load to come out. So these are the rest of the songs. They're not, uh, they're not the crappier ones. They're not mm -hmm. the ones that were, eh. They're the ones that didn't get finished. So we want these songs to come out. And the only time we feel that they have some relevance well, should be now, days. you know? It surely couldn't be the idea of James and Jason to do it. I suspect they knew they would do a break. 
I suspect they wanted a break from each other. I also suspect there may have been some record company pressure saying, well, guys, you're supposed to deliver an album in 1999. Well, OK, so I'll tell you what, you've got all this stuff left over. Let's make an album from it. But whatever, it was a huge mistake. Maybe a little better than a load, but it still sucked. As the decade drew to a close, it seemed that Metallica were on a downhill slide. Although they still went on huge tours and grossed large fortunes, an increasing number of metal fans doubted the quality of their music. In 1998, they released a covers album, Garage Inc., and followed it the next year with s and a live album recorded with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. Both sold respectively, but by this stage, it had been almost a decade since the band had released a truly great album. So what else is happening with the band? Uh, we're just taking a break right now. We're going to be, um, we're gonna be uh, doing a video for uh, uh, a song for the Mission Impossible soundtrack. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and that's going to be coming out pretty soon. And, uh, and after that, we're going to take uh, some more time off and then hopefully get some, uh, some stuff together, some songs together, and, and tour this July. Oh, really? So you're actually going to go out on the road again? Yeah, we're going to play a handful of dates uh, scattered across the states. And then after that, we're going to take some more time off and then start writing, and hopefully we'll be in the studio by the end of, uh, end of the year. We'll see how that goes. The final nail in the coffin seemed to come in 2001, when Laurels Ulrich outraged literally millions of music fans by announcing that Metallica were suing a file-sharing program manufacturer called Napster. Essentially, Lars stood out as a figurehead for Metallica. He was protecting their own back, their, their own back catalogue and their own revenue. I think people thought at the time, Lars, you're just trying to save yourself money. But it wasn't really about that. There was money involved. Lars was very, very open about that. He said, yes, we're saving ourselves. A, you know, Napster are, are taking away a bit of money from us. But the bigger point here, which people failed to understand, and I think largely do still fail to understand, is that what he was talking about was artist rights. And the fact that if you're an artist and you create something, you should have control over that thing. It was about control, really. People didn't really understand that. And I think his reputation will never recover from the Napster fiasco. By the end of 2001, Metallica were in trouble. The Napster case had cost them a lot of fans. Bassist Jason Newsted had left after 14 years, angry that James wouldn't let him play music with other bands. You know, I didn't want to step away from the thing. It wasn't like 100%, oh yeah, let's go, you know, like get out of here. It weren't like that. It's just something I had to make a decision as a man. You know, like what, you know, what my line is. If somebody crosses that line, then I gotta say stop, you know what I mean? That's what it came to became clear that there were deep-seated issues in the band which needed solving, fast. Proof of this came when James entered rehab for alcoholism, effectively leaving the band for a year. When James returned, he was a new man. He learned that his family had to come before Metallica and that he didn't have to be James Hetfield, the rock star, all the time. With relationships much improved in the band, they turned towards the new album. Writing the songs as a collective for the first time, the band found a new aggression and purpose in the music. It was a bit heavier and a bit faster than what had appeared before, certainly faster than anything that appeared in the 1990s. They'd rediscovered an element of what we'd call thrash metal. Lars was playing fast snare patterns once again, which hadn't done for a while. But this was true on a couple of songs. It wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't the case throughout the album. The original music's far more complex and stranger and much more original than the later records that they've become more of a rock band. In the 90s, it became more of a normal rock band. And St. Anger's an attempt to get out of that, you know. The most notable thing about St. Anger, and certainly the thing that most people pick up on when they don't like it, is the sound. What's, what Lars did was detune the snares on the side of his snare drum, which means that instead of getting a normal snare sound, you get a kind of boom noise when you hit it, and this is prevalent throughout the album. Now, a lot of people hated this um, and thought, why, why have you done this? Why have you gone back to sort of basic garage values. And it all ties in with the fact that Metallica wanted to rediscover some of their early spirit, so it makes sense. Bob used old microphones, he didn't bother tuning James's vocals, you can hear you can hear James hit the odd wrong note vocally. And all in all the album sounded deliberately unsophisticated. This this divided the fan base. Some people admired the fact that it was a, a deliberate heart back. Other people like me really couldn't stand it. Uh St. Anger, I mean, I mean, I can't believe Bob Rock did such a great job producing the other albums. Uh, and saying it's like the worst production job I've ever heard on any album. It's just, God, what is it? Like people are calling it, you know, trash can drums. It's just really like, like you, you, you gotta be kidding me. And, and yeah, the album is 
faster and heavier and, and, and is an angry sound, sounding album, but it just, the songs just aren't that good, you know? And by and large, the album just didn't have that quality that Metallica had, had been so insistent on it in their previous records, even on records which were relatively unsuccessful, like Load and Reload. At least you had some melodies, you had some catchy stuff, you had some heavy stuff as well, you had all the Metallica elements. On, on St. Anger, really, everything sounded very average. With St. Anger in the can, Metallica concentrated on finding a new bass player. When Metallica auditioned Jason's replacement, uh, among the people they spoke to, uh, there was Scott Reeder of the stoner rock Caius, who's an amazing player, but perhaps a little bit laid back and not technical enough for Metallica. There was Twiggy Ramirez, who had played with Marilyn Manson's band, um, a great player, but perhaps he didn't quite have the sort of ballsy energy that they required. Um, and the man they ultimately recruited was Rob Trujillo, who had been in Suicidal Tendencies, and in, he had his own uh, funk rock side project called Infectious Grooves. Now, what they were looking for in a bass player, I think, was someone who obviously was uh, technically proficient enough to be able to handle it. And in fact, Lars said later of the other guys that he thought they, the, the songs were about 10% too difficult for their skills. But also someone who could um, push them. What, what James and Lars said about Rob when they recruited him was that he pushes us to achieve. Rob said himself that his, his ethos in life is to step up or is to take the next step. And when you watch the scene in Some Kind of Monster when Rob is playing his audition, he chose to play Battery, one of the toughest songs they do. You can see him standing there sort of nonchalantly knocking out this riff while the other guys are sort of almost playing up to his standard, not the other. I always regard him as one of the best bass players I've ever seen. Oh, he's an excellent bassist, you know. One of, uh, I, I met him when he was still in Suicidal Tendencies. He's a really nice guy, too. He's phenomenal. He's an incredible bass player. He is incredible. He was incredible. I remember seeing Slayer at Ruthie's Inn. He was just all over the, all over the place. Robert Shahid is a very talented bassist on stage. He's probably a better player, technically, than either Cliff Burton or Jason Newstead. But if anybody's going to make a difference to that band, they have to be an equal partner and not a hired hand. And Robert Shaquillo is a hired hand for Metallica. He's hired to play bass, do it very, very well, absolutely very well. He's a dynamo on stage, but is he going to make any difference where it really matters in the studio when it comes to writing new songs and taking a lead in terms of Metallica's direction? I don't think so. With Robert Trujillo in the band, a new album to promote, and the issues built up over the decades melting away, Metallica went on tour. But surprise, surprise, not everybody liked the new album. The reason why St. Anger sounded the way it did was because they had an agenda behind it. They weren't just putting out an album with some songs. What they wanted to do was strip back everything, all the baggage that had accumulated over the decades, and go back to the old style and just produce a raw blast of musical fury. Now, while that approach is to be, uh, is to be applauded, and in fact, they bigged it up hugely before the record was released. This is the heaviest album, this is the fastest, it's extreme, it's this, that, and the other. When it actually came out, everyone was ready for this, and there was this enormous disappointment because, in fact, it isn't that heavy. It isn't that fast. It isn't that exciting. It's not that powerful. They've, they've just lost sight of who they are and, and, and uh, are, are just kind of like, as people say, they're, they're just kind of in this, this big loop and I don't think they've, they've, they've really just kind of forgotten where they come from and what they were supposed to be. The talent is still there if the will is still there. Now, I feel that Lars and James are so far apart now the only thing holding them together is the fact they're in the same band. And even then, they're not quite sure why they're in the same band. I think they need something radical. I think they need to shake up that band. And you know how I'd shake it up? I'd bring back Dave Mustaine. I think you put Mustaine back in that band with Hepfield, with Ulrich, and with whoever on bass, get, I get Newstead back. I think you actually have a great album in the making. But they need to shake things up. Because to be honest, there's no connection between Lars Ulrich's traveling the world, hanging out with celebrities, buying art and following trendy music, and James Hetfield getting more and more into the redneck lifestyle, hunting, listening to country music, wearing cowboy boots. There's no connection between the two lifestyles anymore, and they come together and probably look at each other and say, who are you? Why are we sitting together? You put something like Mustaine into the, into the mix as a catalyst, and I think then you have the real possibility of Metallica making another great album. And I'd like to see something of that radical nature happen.
it's one of those things where, you know, they've accomplished so much, you know, it's like, where do you go from here, you know? So now I think it's good, you know, it's important that they, like, you know, have fun with it, you know, have fun and just remember what it was about, you know? It's hard when you get older and you got, you know, your bank accounts are just like, you, know, you can buy anything you want and you can do anything you want and you can go wherever you want. It's like, what do you do? You know, it's, you gotta, it's hard to stay hungry when you're in that kind of situation. Perhaps Metallica will surprise us all with more amazing metal albums, or perhaps they'll gracefully retire in a few years' time. But whatever happens, you can bet it'll be interesting and very, very loud. I think you feel like you could be like the Rolling Stones with like 50. <laughs> hey! Yeah. <laughs> interesting, man. I, you know, I'm not a prophet. I'm, I'm horrible at planning things. I, I can't, you know, that's why I got a wife, I think. But I'm, I, I'm not a prophet. When it doesn't feel right anymore, we're, we're done. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Just as you and I find you